the misshapen corpse under Stormvale. That is a sacred relic of the Black Knives Plot, as that famed night of assassination is known. It happened during the golden age of the Erd Tree, long before the shattering of the Elden Ring. Someone stole a fragment of the Rune of Death from Malaketh, the Black Blade, and on a bitter night, murdered Godwin the Golden. That was the first recorded death of a demigod in all history, and it became the catalyst. Soon, the Elden Ring was smashed, and thus sprang forth the war known as the Shattering. The world has grown crooked, and if you intend to put it to rights, you'd better understand what happened to make it this way. The lands between have suffered in many ways. Most recently, the Shattering has upended the order of the world, plunging the world into utter chaos. Yet before that, a slower corruption was unleashed upon the world. On a dark night of treason, the demigod Godwin the Golden was struck down in an event that would shake the foundations of the world. Not only was Godwin the first of the demigods to die, but it also set into motion a series of events that would erode the very foundations of the Golden Order. For Godwin did not die in the normative sense. Instead, it was his soul that was slain and his body left to rot without it. And Godwin's body would live on as the Prince of Death. From Godwin's living corpse would spread the death root, and from its loins, a whole host of life within death would spring. These beings exist outside the boundaries of the established Golden Order, the Order of the World. They pollute and taint its truth. And the signs of this corruption can be seen everywhere, from Lyarnia even to Faram Azula. The result is some of the most tragic stories in Elden Ring, of a prince and a people who through no fault of their own have been left to rot outside of the bounds of order. And yet conversely, we also get some of the greatest heroes arising from this tragedy, individuals ready to sacrifice everything to undo the wrongs that have been done. So join me this week as we assess the history and undeath of Godwin, the Prince of Death. Remember guys, if you enjoy Elden Ring lore videos, then please consider subscribing to the channel, as I have plenty of lore content for you to unpack. And please like and comment on this video, as it helps the channel out immensely. What we know of Godwin the Golden before his murder is sparse, but we can build a somewhat semi-coherent impression of a fairly gallant and heroic figure. Of course, Godwin is one of the most famous early members of the Golden lineage, the offspring of Marika and Godfrey. For example, the finger reader in the Deep Root Depths says the following of Godwin. A scion of the Golden Bow, sentenced to live in death. How could such a thing come to be? Of course, the term Scion of the Golden Bow, meaning that he is a branch or offshoot of the Golden Bow, the Golden Lineage. And while it's never directly mentioned that he is the son of Marika and Godfrey and he could just be an offshoot, it is implied that he is through the Golden Epitaph Sword, in which we quite often associate the prayer from a young boy being of Mikola, and we will certainly go into that in more detail later in this video. But Mikola refers to Godwin as a brother, and of course being his brother would make sense if they are both the children of Marika. And given Godwin is heavily involved in the early events of the Golden Lineage's history, I think it is a fair assumption to make that he is Marika and Godfrey's son rather than just a relative or offshoot a couple of generations removed from Godfrey and Marika. However, I do just bring this all up because it is worth remembering it isn't directly stated that Godwin is Marika and Godfrey's son. However, his clear connection to the early Golden Lineage means that he was one of the first demigods. For example, Godric's Great Rune reads the following. The first demigods were the Elden Lord Godfrey and his offspring, the Golden Lineage. And while Godric specifically admires Godfrey, Godwin in his early years is essentially everything that Godric wishes to be. Powerful, respected, and a member of the Golden Lineage who wears the title Golden with pride. We know that one of the greatest exploits attributed to Godwin's life is his role in defeating the dragons who invaded Leyendel in the war against the dragons. 
We learn of this war via Gransax's bolt, which reads the following. A great ancient dragon, Gransax, once reigned calamity upon the royal capital, the only time in historical record that Lanedale's walls have fallen. This marked the dawn of the war against the ancient dragons. This mighty dragon, Gransax, is the gigantic corpse that we can still witness in Lanedale today, alongside his mighty bolt spear. This war appears to have been a massive challenge to the Erdtree forces, as it is noted that this was the only time that the falls of Lanedale would fall. This is significant, for we know that even in the warring tribes of the demigods during the Shattering, that no one could pierce the mighty barriers, and we know of two instances specifically where the forces of Lanedale repelled all invading demigods, the first and second defences of Lanedale. This helps emphasise the power and brutality of this assault, for it even eclipses what the demigods would be able to muster. Another dragon that took part in this assault would be Fortisax, a dragon who is one of the mightiest amongst his brethren, and we learn of Fortisax's renown via Fortisax's lightning spear, which reads as follows. During the war of the ancient dragons, these twin red lightning stakes were the hallmark of one ancient dragon who was called the mightiest boulderstone. Fortisax was one of the most dangerous dragons in this conflict, and yet Godwin the Golden would step up in this war and earn the respect of this adversary, something we learn via the relevant sword memorial, which reads as follows. The routing of the ancient dragons. Godwin the Golden fought to the last, earning the friendship of dread Fortisax. So this sword memorial tells us quite a lot about Godwin as a person and a warrior. He was clearly a great fighter and a courageous one at that. The term fought to the last suggests a real brutal conflict in which Godwin was one of the last fighting, one of the last standing. And given Fortisax's reputation, it makes Godwin's renown as a warrior even more when we learn that Godwin was actually able to defeat the mighty Fortisax and we learn this from the Lightning Spear Incantation, which reads as follows. Long ago, Godwin the Golden defeated the ancient dragon Fortisax and befriended his fallen foe, an event that would give rise to the ancient dragon cult in the capital. So Godwin is evidently a respected and powerful warrior, but is also magnanimous in victory. For not only does he spare the mighty Fortisax, a dangerous foe, but is so honourable that he befriends him, a loyalty that will be repaid in kind tenfold later down the line as we will see later on in this video. So while we don't get many pieces of information about Godwin in his early life, what we do learn about him is pretty interesting. He was evidently a powerful warrior, a powerful demigod, powerful enough to contend with the dragons, but he was also a man of mercy and foresight. His friendship with Fortisax inspires both sides of the conflict and turns a devastating war into an alliance between the capital and dragonkind. As the Lightning Spear states, this friendship would result in the rise of a dragon cult, and even Lantsax, Fortisax's sister, would become the priestess to this cult, and we learn of this specifically from Lantsax's glaive, which reads as follows. Lantsax was the sister of Fortisax. It is said she took the form of a human to commune with the knights as a priestess of the dragon cult. Therefore, the worship of dragon and the incorporation of their powers would become highly popular among the Lanedale knights. We can even see them wielding these powers in the game. And as is said by the gravel stone seal, the worship of ancient dragons does not conflict with belief in the Erd Tree. After all, this seal and lightning itself are both imbued with gold. One of the most famous of these dragon cultists would be Dragon Knight Kristoff, who would be mighty enough to capture Godefroy, one of the golden lineage. Yet another famous adherent of this cult would be none other than Vyke himself, who we learn from Vyke's dragon bolt was Lantsax's favourite, and it is clear that before pursuing the frenzied flame, he was a distinguished dragon knight. All of this is a part of Godwin's legacy, a tribute to his actions prior to his murder, and as I said at the beginning of the video, it paints a fairly positive picture of this fallen lord. 
everything thus far attributed to him is positive, a powerful warrior and yet a gracious one. And there is one other interaction that we can attribute to Godwin tentatively, and this is some sort of relationship developed with his half-brother Mikola, and he himself one of the greatest among their number. So to earn Mikola's respect is a good thing indeed. We get the evidence that Mikola appears to have developed a fondness for his half-brother from the golden epitaph sword that I mentioned earlier. That item reads as follows. A sword made to commemorate the death of Godwin the Golden, first of the demigods to die. Infused with a humble prayer of a young boy, O brother, Lord brother, please die a true death. So the reason that we attribute this prayer to Mikola as the most likely candidate is because later we find another connection between Mikola and Godwin at Castle Saul that implies Mikola's enduring empathy for Godwin's position, but we will return to that in a later chapter. The point of highlighting this relationship is just to humanise Godwin the Golden further, who wasn't always the lifeless Prince of Death. It shows that he was a figure of such stature and personality that he even gained the love and respect of Mikola, himself a beloved, wise and respected figure. In totality, this has always given me a very positive image and view of Godwin, a pretty colossal figure in the early years of Erdtree royal family history, and a proud representative of the Golden Order. So with that being said, let us now turn to the Night of the Black Knives, the event that would transform Godwin and the world forever. So I'm really interested to analyse this event from a Godwin-centric perspective, so we can get into the real nitty gritty of what actually happened, and try and understand the origins of Godwin's current situation. So with that said, let us start off what we know from Roger's description of the event itself. It happened during the golden age of the Erd Tree, long before the shattering of the Elden Ring. Someone stole a fragment of the Rune of Death from Maleketh, the Black Blade and on a bitter night, murdered Godwin the Golden. That was the first recorded death of a demigod in all history. So this happened during the height of the Erdtree's rule. However, it obviously happened after the Rune of Death was confined and sealed by Malekith, following the Godskin apostasy, as the Rune needed to be with Malekith for it to be stolen by the Knight of the Black Knives conspirators. Malekith's sealing of death and death following the Godskin apostasy is an event well evidenced by the Godskin apostle Set, which reads the following. The apostles, once said to serve death and death, are wielders of the godslain Black Flame, but after their defeat by Malekith, the Black Blade, the source of their power was sealed away. The source of that power that Malekith would seal is of course the Rune of Death, or Death and Death, as we learn via Malekith's Remembrance. We learn from Malekith's Black Blade that it was only after the Night of the Black Knives, that fateful night, that he would seal the rune within his own flesh, and when we come for Death and Death, this is where it yet remains, as we see when he draws it out of himself in the second stage of his fight. Prior to this, however, he wielded it rather flamboyantly within his Black Blade, as we learn via the description of Malekith's armour, which reads as follows. Malekith, Queen Marika's loyal half-brother, bore a blade imbued with death and death, and there was not one demigod who did not fear him. And while it is not easy for us to steal death and death, in fact we need to kill the Black Blade himself, at this stage, if it is just within his sword, it would certainly set the stage for the ultimate heist. On a night of wintry fog, The rune of death was stolen. And the demigods began to fall. Starting with Godwin the Golden. Queen Marika was driven to the brink. From Malekith's blade, a fragment of the Rune of Death was stolen, 
and it would remain the greatest failure of Malekith, for which he would attempt to atone for the coming years, to little success. Before we go any further, we need to understand what the Rune of Death is, so that we can better understand what the assassins were trying to achieve in this attack. The Rune of Death goes by two names. The other is Destined Death. The forbidden shadow plucked from the Golden Order upon its creation. Destined Death, also known as the Rune of Death, was confined upon the creation of the Golden Order, something we learn about via the Mending Rune of the Death Prince. So the Rune of Death was clearly a part of the Greater Elden Ring prior to this confinement, given the term Rune is used here, the same term used to describe the shattered fragments of the Elden Ring found throughout the world and in the possession of the demigods. Further cementing this idea, when we use a Mending Rune at the end of the game, we are incorporating a new rune into the Elden Ring, which is built up of different runes that govern the lands between. For that is what the Elden Ring is, a source of power that influences the world and governs its laws. The best illustration of how the Elden Ring and its incorporated runes work is the confinement of the Rune of Death itself, for when it is removed, we very much see the effect of death being removed from the laws of the land. The removal of the Rune of Death from the Elden Ring has made the world a deathless hell, hence why everyone in the world is a pathetic dried out husk, a zombie, and this is best described by the aristocratic set worn by the wardering nobles, who are very zombie-like, and so it was literally the power of death a rune of death that the assassins wished to imbue their weapons with, so that they would be once again bring death to the gods, in a world absent death. These knives, their iconic knives that they forge, were made using the power of this stolen fragment of the rune of death, a process described by Rani, one of the ringleaders of the event. Indeed, I am the witch Rani. I stole a fragment of the rune of death and used it to forge the god-slaying black knives through fearsome right. So with a fragment, and only a fragment, bear in mind, Rani and her co-conspirators forged these knives using the power of death and death, meaning each blade was literally forged from death itself. This is not the only time that a fearsome right was used to forge a god-slaying blade, and it is one of those nice instances of coherent lore that establishes precedent. What I'm referring to, of course, is the Finger Slayer Blade, forged by the Nox as well. The Nox, of course, being Rani's allies in the Night of the Black Knives. And so therefore, for me at least, it makes it a lot more easy to understand where the ability to forge such dangerous blades had come from. In my opinion, it is the method of creation that also influenced the very shape of the blades, their spiky, iconic form not too dissimilar from the half-wheel of the centipede, the form of the Rune of Death. The result is obviously a blade drenched in the power of death and death, as is most easily seen when the assassins use the power of the Red Flame, much like Malekith can. In my Eternal Cities lore video, which I highly recommend watching for a more in-depth look at the Nox, I spoke on how the Nox were a community of Numen defined by their allegiance to the stars, and that they are evidently excellent craftsmen and alchemists. We can see their craft in the many creations attributed to them, like the Dragonkin, the Finger Slayer Blade, Puppetry, and now, tentatively, these Black Knives, which no doubt combined Nox's knowledge with Rani's power and sorcery. I mention this because I believe Noxian ingenuity is no doubt what provided the science or magic behind the iconic assassin cloak and armours, and we learn of the potency of these relics from Roger, who says the following. You recall our conversation about the Knight of the Black Knives, yes? They say the assassins who carried out the deed were scions of the Eternal City, a group entirely of women arrayed in armor of silver under cloaks which fooled the eye. Indeed, when we meet some of the assassins ourselves, we know this to be true, given they can strike at us entirely unseen until it is too late. Again, this is a well-written bit of lore for me, because we actually have precedent of the Noxians having developed sorcery that revolves around fooling the eye. 
I of course refer to the sorceries developed in Celia, Town of Sorcery, a town descended from the Nox and the Eternal Cities. I vow to impart to you my knowledge of the lost sorceries of the Celians, descendants of the Eternal. Aside from this statement from Gowry, we get other bits of proof tying the town to the Eternal Cities. Of course, most notably, the Crypt Chair, which is also incorporated into Celia's coat of arms. Not to mention the presence of a Nox monk and swordstress guarding the chair. Finally, the Celian sorceries themselves are called Night Sorceries, tying it closely to the Nox, the Latin word for night. And if that still doesn't convince you for some reason, one of these Celian Night Sorceries, Night Maiden's Mist, taught by Gowry, is explicitly a Noxian practice. Not only is it a spell utilised by the Night Maidens of Nocron and named after them, but it also says the following. One of the Night Sorceries of Celia, Town of Sorcery. Below Celia, the Eternal City of Nocron sleeps. This sorcery originates from the Maiden of that place. So now that we have firmly tied Celia and its night sorceries to the Eternal Cities, let us now consider the practices actually developed within this town. Well, having a look at it, we quickly come to realise that these sorceries are developed with the intent of aiding assassinations. For example, the Night Shard reads as follows. One of the night sorceries of Celia, Town of Sorcery. The Celian sorcerers were assassins and it is said that they often hunted their fellows. And so we begin to get an idea of how the Black Knife Assassins could have been developed as a concept, especially when we look at the most pertinent sorcery, Unseen Form, which to me is no doubt linked to the Assassin's hidden form. I think that this is again one of the most satisfying and well thought out pieces of lore in the entire game, because everything that makes up a Black Knife Assassin has a tie to existing background lore and it is a holistic combination of Noxian scientific and magical developments. We have the Finger Slayer Blade, which explains the Nox and Newman penchant for forging these weapons. We have the Night Sorceries of Celia, that can help explain the development of invisibility. And finally, the Black Knife Assassins themselves are all nimble female warriors, extremely reminiscent of the all-female bodyguards of the Night Maidens, the Swordstress. It all makes it feel real. The Black Knife Assassins aren't just a plot point shoehorned in. They are a culmination of a culture's development and practices, and I really appreciate this detail. It's also a pretty cool thought that the Knight of the Black Knives was partially gestated from the Town of Sorcery that seems pretty good at hiding its deeper secrets. Let us return to the assassination itself. The way in which these blades were brought to bear against Godwin is unusual. The assassins did not merely stab Godwin, but seem to have carved his flesh instead. Indeed, we see this taking place in the intro cinematic, where Godwin is being restrained so that the rune of death can be carved into his flesh. This carving of the Hallowbrand is actually well described by Fia, who says the following. Have you ever seen a Hallowbrand? When the first of the demigods died, his flesh was marked with the half-wheel wound of the centipede. So it seems for this fragment of the Rune of Death to actually work, the curse mark must be carved in full upon the intended victim. And this is further illustrated by the other victim of the Knight of the Black Knives, Rani. She herself has another half of this Hallowbrand carved into her original flesh, found atop the tower in Laernia. The curse mark pulled from her body gives us more details, as it reads the following. Curse mark carved into the discarded flesh of Rani the Witch, also known as the half-wheel wound of the centipede. This curse mark was carved at the moment of death of the first demigod, and should have taken the shape of a circle. However, two demigods perished at the same time, breaking the curse mark into two half-wheels. Rani was the first of the demigod whose flesh perished, while the Prince of Death perished in soul alone. So we can physically see the curse mark wounded into Rani's flesh, again reinforcing the fact that not only are these blades imbued with death, but to take the intended effect, the curse mark of death needed to actually be carved 
onto the victim's flesh, as it is both carved onto Godwin's flesh and Rani's. However, we learn some specifics to the outcome of the Night of the Black Knives. The wounds on both Godwin's and Rani's bodies are halves of the one whole, that if put together would form the circular whole of a curse of death. Now, the fact that this item description says should have may lead one to believe that the intent behind the attack was to fully kill Godwin with both half of the wheel, so he died in soul and in flesh. That it was an accident that led to Rani dying in body when the wheel fractured. Yet this doesn't appear to be the case, and it appears the breaking of the wheel was actually intended by Rani, as she says the following. But I would not acquiesce to the two fingers. I stole the rune of death, slew mine own Imperian flesh, casting it away. I would not be controlled by that thing. So I'm quite sure this nuance is clear to most people at this point in the game's life cycle. But this dialogue heavily implies that Rani planned for the Knight of the Black Knives to go the way it did. Her real objective was actually to slay her own Imperian flesh. Her flesh is even described as discarded flesh in the curse mark item description, suggesting that she got rid of this flesh. How she actually achieved this result and broke the wheel is an interesting process to consider, as she too seems to have the half wound, the other half, carved into her back physically. It's hard to get your head around, but my belief is that while the assassins were carving the rune into Godwin, Rani was committing a similar act upon herself, and the fact it happened at the same time broke the Hallibrand between them, condemning Godwin to shoulder the burden of the soul death half while Rani benefited from the death in body. In the curse mark description, it describes the breaking of the wheel in the following way. However, two demigods perished at the same time, breaking the curse mark into two wheels. The use of that word creates a chain of causality with what comes next in that sentence, i.e. it was because two demigods died simultaneously that the wheel was broken splitting the totality of death into two halves, one dying of flesh and one dying in soul. Rani only wanted to have the effects of one side of the wheel and so used Godwin as a totem for the other half to achieve her aims. This does tie up with what we know of Rani and we see in her actions. She is trying to sever all ties with the two fingers, as it appears that when she was chosen as Imperian, she was in some metaphysical way bound to them and unable to follow a path of her own choosing. But by doing this, by cruelly forcing Godwin into her bid for freedom, she condemns a man to a horrific fate and would inadvertently cause the spread of the death route. However, it is the first step in her ultimate goal of severing her connection to her fingers and we do see her carry on this path in her questline. She has first slayed her own flesh, she then kills the pursuing baleful shadows, and then finally slays her own two fingers, allowing her to pursue her own objectives and cast off her predetermined fate as an Empyrean for the greater will. If this is the case, then Godwin's death is even more tragic, as it makes him seem as mere collateral damage to Rani's plans, and the fact she has essentially condemned a man to live forever in undeath as a soulless ghoul is something people should consider if they view Rani as a hero. And while I think this is true from Rani's perspective, as in this was the objective of the Knight of the Black Knives, I don't think it is as simple as this for the rest of the conspirators involved. I believe they had different ideas as to what would happen. So let's try and analyse the aftermath of the Knight of the Black Knives and what the other motivations may have been for the other conspirators, though I do want to make it clear what follows is my own speculation based on environmental storytelling and in-game lore. So the first co-conspirators are of course the Black Knife assassins themselves. Were they aware of Rani's full intentions? It would certainly make sense if they did, given both parties want to bring about an Age of Night, and yet despite this, I do believe there's evidence that the assassins and Rani are now at loggerheads. Firstly, Rani asks us to retrieve the Finger Slayer Blade from the city of Nokron. Consider why we would actually need to do this if Rani was still allies 
with the Nox. Surely they would give her this tool that would help her achieve the Age of Night. Furthermore, Rani doesn't even know where the city of Nokron is. Again, a curious state of affairs for someone supposedly allied with the Nox. And then there of course is the bizarre series of events that involve Rani's counsellors and their attempted and actual deaths at the hand of the Black Knife assassins. As Blythe seems to be surrounded by Black Knife assassins as if they have tried to kill him, and Eiji's body is similarly surrounded by the corpses of Black Knife assassins. So I had once considered that this was Rani cleaning house, that she had commanded the assassins to take out Blythe and Eiji, and while I am more or less certain that she turned Celibus into a puppet as an ironic punishment for his plans for her, I don't think this makes sense that she would just kill the others, given she says this near the end of her quest. Now I can finally stand before them. This is farewell, my dear. Tell Blythe and E.G. I love them. They are her childhood friends, and as ruthless as I see Rani to be, I very much she could bring herself to slaughter these two in cold blood, directly at least. Leaving them to their fates is another matter entirely, of course. So what do these attacks mean? Well, I speculate that Rani misled the Black Knife assassins, and these attack on Rani's people is an attempt at retribution. Remember the curse mark item description? It says, should have taken the form of a wheel, as if that was the intention behind those who were carving it. I believe that the Black Knife assassins believed they were truly planning to slay the gods, to overthrow the Erd Tree Order and to pick up where the Godskin apostasy and the Glomide Queen had failed. Godwin, as a leading member of the royal family, would have been a juicy target for them in their plans to overthrow the Greater Will. A great act of revenge for their punishment at the hands of the Greater Will. In my Eternal City video, I spoke on the potential connections between the Eternal Cities and the Glomide Queen's apostles. And while e.g. burning in the Black God Slayer Flame could be a mistake, I am of the belief that the Godskins were an Eternal City creation. I won't go into as much detail as I did on that video, and again, I recommend it, but essentially the fascination of the Nox with creating artificial life is very much a facet of their society. Most notably the Albanorix, which we learn were a creation of the Eternal City from some cut tops dialogue. Artificially created life ties in with the description of the godskins found in the swaddling cloth, which to me implies accelerated growth and hand rearing by the Glomide Queen herself, suggesting they aren't people that become godskins, rather they are created. Then there's of course the implied connection between the Black Knife assassins and godskins working together. This is at E.G.'s murder scene of course. Scattered around his body are the corpses of Black Knife assassins, who E.G. evidently killed defending himself. However, he is not burning in the red flame of Death's and Death, the weapon used by the assassins. Rather, he is burning in the black flame of the Godskin Apostles, suggesting it was one of their number who got the final blow on the troll. I think this suggested connection between the Godskin movement and the Black Knives leaves bare their intentions to bring about the deaths of the gods and overthrow them, not help Rani further her own agenda. And while the Nox armor set tell us that they too want to bring about the Age of Stars, I imagine they wouldn't take kindly by being used by another usurper wanting to take the throne for herself. Whatever the motivation or reason behind it, I think it is clear now that the Eternal Cities and Rani are at loggerheads, and it's further backed up by Electo, the leader of the Black Knife's assassins, being imprisoned in the Moonlight Altar a carrion ever jail. I speculate that post Night of the Black Knives, having used them to achieve her goal, Rani imprisoned Electo and the assassins take the heat, which is why we see them scattered throughout the land, hiding in the fringes and deep places of the world. No wonder we need a star to break into Nokron. Quite a tangent. But now let us look at another co-conspirator and what they aim to get out of this, Praetor Rikard. We learn of Rikard's involvement via the Blasphemous Claw item description, which reads as follows. On the night of the dire plot, Rani rewarded Praetor Rikard with these traces. Should the coming trespass one day transpire, 
they would serve as a last resort foil, allowing Rykard to challenge Malekith the Black Blade, the Black Beast of Destiny Death. So it looks like Rani brought Rykard into this plot, and given what we know about him in his later, more overtly blasphemous years, it is easy to see him as an obvious fit. Much like the Eternal City cohort, I believe that Rykard will have just wanted to strike against the gods and America. He doesn't have any connection or care for the Age of Stars. Rani's motive in bringing her brother in is pretty clear. He is just a last minute defence against Malekith. And then of course we need to discuss the possible involvement of Queen Marika in the plot itself. Now I do discuss this possibility in my Marika lore video in far more depth, so please go and watch that if you are interested in a more detailed analysis. But in short, as I am sure most of you are aware, the main evidence for Marika being involved comes from the Black Knife Assassin armour set that describes the women as Newman closely associated with Marika, as well as certain dialogues that imply a sort of utilitarian view of her own children. As I said in my Marika video, I am not someone who personally believes this to be 100% true, yet I do also acknowledge the legitimacy of the theory, especially given the language used in the Black Knife Assassin armour set. And so with that said, if she was involved, what do I believe to be her motivations? Well, as said in my previous Marika video, a thoughtful Reddit post by the user Ha links the scrolls and tablets found in Marika's chambers to the declaration she makes regarding studying the depths of the Golden Order for an answer. In Marika's own words, I declare mine intent to search the depths of the Golden Order through understanding of the proper way, our faith, our grace is increased. Those blissful early days of blind belief are long past. My comrades, why must ye falter? In my mind, if we are to entertain the idea that Marika murdered her own son, I believe it is a reaction to her study and identification of the flaw in the Golden Order and that it was a calculated move to expose this flaw that she had identified through her studies. This flaw, of course, was the absence of death, a glitch in the system that could not rectify itself when the Rune of Death was reintroduced through Godwin's murder. And so with that said, let us actually examine the resulting effects of Godwin's murder, the spread of the Death Root, and the rise of the Prince of Death. After his murder, the corpse of the fallen demigod was buried in the Deep Root Depths, something we can pick up from the Prince of Death pustule. In your first playthrough, most likely the first sight you get of Godwin is the intro cinematic that shows him being murdered by the Black Knife Assassins. Yet despite this gruesome scene, we get the picture of a beautiful godlike figure, a muscular physique and flowing golden locks. This is also in line with what we see in the story trailer, which again could have been many people's first sight of the Golden Prince. So this later becomes very unsettling when players get their first look at what we learn to be a visage of Godwin, hidden at the bottom of Stormvale Castle. I genuinely find the look of this face subconsciously disturbing and repulsive. Something deep within me does not like this face. It feels wrong. And when we look at the thematics in a later part of this chapter, you will see this is exactly the intent. It reminds me of an oyster, with its multiple folds of skin, and it is distinctly unnatural and incredibly well done. And indeed the oyster does seem to be spot on, because we will see the full aquatic form of Godwin later, as well as tying it in with the relevance of water to Godwin and those who live in death. It is Rogier who later confirms that this haunting face is a relic of the Knight of the Black Knives, a visage of Godwin. Indeed, Rogier warns us away from this face because it does indeed possess the death blight of Godwin, the power of the Prince of Death, something Rogier himself has fallen afoul of, an event we can witness through his bloodstain. And now the death blight writhes through his body. He is saturated by the power of death. When we finally do find Godwin, the true Godwin, in the depths of the lands between, in the deep root depths, it is made all the clearer that the visage we see under Stormville is a spot on replica, more or less, 
of Godwin's true face. And indeed, this visage is actually just one of many faces of Godwin. These aren't just relics or bits of skin, these are considered to be true copies of Godwin's face. For example, the face under Stormvale is actually referred to as a visage of the Prince of Death, something we can see from the Prince of Death's pustule that we pull from this very face. It reads as follows, A fetid pustule taken from facial flesh. It is said that this pustule came from the visage of the Prince of Death, he who used to be called Godwin. So this is actual facial flesh, it's real, it's a real replica of Godwin. It initially appears to be a confusing contradiction, given we find the true face later, but Godwin's appearance is superbly analysed and explained in two videos from Zuli the Witch. They are Godwin Prince of Death and the Terrible Truth About Godwin videos. I also just want to let you know at this stage that Zuli's work will be heavily referenced in this section, as a lot of the details we learn of the Prince of Death's influence and matter comes from the environmental storytelling, and Zuli has by far been the most prolific in these subjects in regards to Godwin. Let us first deal with the replica visage that we had just been discussing. In the video The Terrible Truth About Godwin, Zuli identifies that Godwin's image is spreading throughout the lands between, as we can see from the deathly pale eye growths in areas where the death root has spread, even spreading as far as Fire Missoula. Suggesting this isn't a growth in the normative sense, it is more like a curse, spreading in the lands between, but we'll discuss that thematic in a moment. These eyes are clearly reminiscent of the Prince of Death's true eyes, but we can also see these eyes on the growths surrounding him in the deep root depths, giving this the true nature of these strange eye growths found spreading with the death root. Zuli therefore suggests that the Godwin visage in Stormvale could very well be a more advanced type of this growth that has grown from beyond just being eyes, but has become an almost full replica of the Death Prince, and I agree that this is the most satisfying explanation to me, as I had long considered this to be some kind of vestige of the true Godwin, and given that this is actually made of facial flesh, it seems to be that these eye growths or the growths spreading throughout the lands between may well all turn into true copies of the Prince of Death. This does also seem to be backed up by the fact we see his visage duplicated elsewhere. Firstly, in the cysts and pustules, you can see the outlines of Godwin's face. But of course, there's also the crabs that we find in Altus Plateau and Laernia, and again you will note that these are all waterlogged areas, and we will deal with that soon. These crabs straight up have the visage, face of Godwin upon their backs, eyes included, again reinforcing the fact that Godwin can literally spread his face, his body, far and wide through the death route and through the spreading blight of those who live in death. Does he see through all of these eyes? Does he feel all of these faces? The implications of this are pretty huge, and given enough time, could Godwin seep through the entire world, turning it into Godwin? It is definitely suggested that this is the case, it is an unending spread, and the spread of the death route has already transformed patches of the world. Before we go further, we do need to talk about Godwin's appearance in general, given we are going to be talking about the thematic overlays in the next part of the chapter. In a very surface level analysis, we of course get the immediate allusions to the themes of water, both in the oyster-esque head and the fish-like tail that has replaced his legs. And just as a quick personal note, I absolutely love this design. Godwin is one of the best designed parts of the entire game. I find it so abhorrent and so shocking compared to his original description in the introduction. It reminds me of the shock I felt when I first faced True King Alant in the original Demon Souls. The cherry on the top, of course, is the blonde hair, still present in this wretched form, a mockery of his original form, and a reminder that this was Godwin the Golden. Yet there are deeper connection to Godwin's appearance that we can mine, not just it being an aquatic theme, and again Zuli has delivered on this front in their Godwin Prince of Death video. In this video, Zuli makes a possible suggestion of Godwin's appearance being linked to the Japanese myth of the Ningyo, and that it may be seen as a part of a recurring theme in FromSoft games, such as the Divine Dragon which is referred to as a Nyingyo in the game files, 
and of course Kos from Bloodborne that share very similar facets to the Ningyo. The Ningyo are essentially mermaids whose flesh, if consumed, confers immortality, but catching one is meant to bring calamity, and this does tie in with the cursed immortality of those who live in death, and so this satisfies me on the aesthetic level. However, there is more thematically, and at this point I'm going to reference another content creator, Acer Aesthetics, and specifically I'm referencing their stellar video on the ideas of pollution and taboo found within Silent Hill, a video called The Horror Lost in Translation, a video that looks at the Eastern cultural influences found in Silent Hill that the Western audience may miss, and in general Acer's channel is filled with these amazing video essays on some of your favourite games, so please go and check out their channel. The Silent Hill video is extremely useful to me however, not only because Silent Hill is one of my favourite games of all time, but Acer analyses themes that are also very useful in analysing the themes tied to Godwin. In this video, Acer uses a certain Japanese term to discuss defilement, pollution and taboos, Kigari. Kigari is described by Wikipedia as a state of defilement caused by varying events, including contact with any form of death or corpse. But Acer goes further, describing Kigari as the crossing of boundaries, the transitions between life and death for example, and when these boundaries are crossed, you get impurity, you get Kigari. In Silent Hill, the boundaries being crossed vary from game to game, but in each game Kigari is represented by the horrible nightmares that each protagonist must face. In the first Silent Hill, for example, we witness the horrendous birth of the cult's god. Childbirth is the crossing of a boundary, and thus can fall under Kigari. And in Silent Hill 1, some of the enemies we face are representative of that corruption caused by the Kigari of the birth of a god, such as maggot, grub, and moth enemies. To me, this can be specifically applied to Godwin's appearance and his corruption throughout the land. To straight up quote Acer when he is talking about a corpse relation to Kigari, he says, and I quote, Kigari can also mean corruption and defilement. For example, the presence of a corpse corrupts the environment around it because a corpse is a seedbed for maggots and other impurities, real and spiritual. If you touch it, you will also get Kigari, and you will spread it until you clean yourself. End quote. Does this sound familiar? The presence of a corpse causing corruption that spreads to others who then spread it further? This is why Godwin's appearance is so deeply corrupted. He is a living corpse who has been buried and his corruption has spread. He has crossed the boundaries of natural life. The moment his soul was obliterated and his corpse was left behind, he became a seedbed for the corruption that pollutes the lands between. Godwin, through no fault of his own, has crossed these sacred bounds, not only between life and death, but outside the boundaries set by the Golden Order, and he will continue to be a source of impurity, a source of Kegari, until he is destroyed or is brought back within the bounds of what is accepted. And as Zuli points out, there aren't just those who live in death, but there appears to be new life forms that are created by contact with the Death Prince himself, spreading this corruption even further. The examples Uli gives are of course the Basilisks, that have clearly had their eyes modified from prior Souls games to be more in line with Godwin's eyes in this game. In addition, their connection to Godwin is made all the clearer by their location in areas connected to death, such as in the Deep Root Depths, the Realm of the Prince of Death, they wield the death blight of the death prince, again spreading that corruption, and they also have amphibian features, tying them to the water themes which we'll look at in the next chapter, and the Piscine features of Godwin himself. You'll see his arms are very similar to the arms of these basilisks. They of course aren't the only life forms capable of inflicting death blight. There are of course the mysterious and confusing worm faces. These are the tree looking humanoids, with worms burrowed into their faces. The connection to Godwin is of course clear from their appearance. The maggots or mealworms in their face very heavily connected to death and decay. They also spread the death blight. 
In Zuli's video on them, she interestingly identifies the fact that the file name for these enemies in the game is Deracine, which is a French term referring to the uprooting of trees. Now this does line up nicely with the appearance of worm faces. The worms look like the roots of upturned trees. And I would suggest that their locations are also significant. The two main areas that we find them in are A. Affected with death blight and B. Have trees. This is the location in Faramazula and Altus Plateau respectively. So my most likely explanation for their appearance is that they are somehow connected to the areas that are affected with death blight that also have trees. Faramazula does have the infection of Godwin, so this area we find them in is also afflicted with the death blight. Is it possible they are actually trees that have been corrupted? They are very tree and wooden looking. Otherwise, of course, they could have just taken their appearance from their surrounding environments and are pure creatures of corruption. This is, of course, my speculation on Zuli's video and what we see of the environmental details but it is one that satisfies my understanding of these beings to a degree. Now, while I'm sympathetic to Godwin and his plight, this does all paint a terrifying picture about his reach and the transformative, corrupting nature of his power. So with that said, let us look at the spread of his corruption in more detail in the next chapter. The spread of the death route was facilitated by the manner in which his body was handled and buried. We know from the Prince of Death's pustule that he was buried at the roots of the great tree, as it reads as follows. It is said that this pustule came from the visage of the Prince of Death, he who used to be called Godwin. As first of the demigods, it is said he is buried deep under the capital, at the Erd Tree's roots. Indeed, this obviously marries up with what we see in game. Godwin's corpse slumped against its very roots in the deep root depths. While this may seem like a pretty silly idea in retrospect, it does make sense with the lore of the world, given we know from numerous sources that the Erd Tree burial was the idealised form of honouring the dead, where the dead were returned to the roots of the great tree. Yet it was this connection of his body against these roots that facilitated the spread, something that we have confirmed by the description of Death Root itself, which reads as follows. On the night of the dire plot, the stolen rune of death enabled the first death of a demigod. Later, the rune of death spread across the lands between, through the underground roots of the great tree, sprouting in the form of death root. And as expected from From Software's masterful environmental storytelling, this too is reflected by what we see in game. At Godwin's throne, we see the death blight spreading from his shattered form and infecting the roots of the great tree to spread throughout the world. And of course, it is important to comprehend what this death root really is. The item description says it all. The death root is the fragments of the rune of death that was stolen on that fateful night. These are the fragments of the fragment that was stolen from Malekith, and as such, it explains his motivation in working with the hunters to retrieve this death root. He is trying to undo his mistake to restore the Rune of Death proper, and thus restore the Golden Order. Garank actually hungers for the Rune of Death, for the Death Root, because he feels the Rune of Death since it is bound within his own flesh, and we learn from Malekith's Black Blade that it was actually bound within his flesh after the Night of the Black Knives. And as such, he hungers for it to be complete, because it is part of him as well. Tragically, for Malekith, some bells cannot be unrung, and while we return all of the death route, Malekith realises that the affliction of the Wheel of the Centipede has spread too far and has seeped into the very soil of the lands between. The Rune of Death can no longer be restored. It is... it is all consumed. Still, I am not sated. Not nearly sated. So this is where we return to what happened to Godwin on the Night of the Black Knives. Godwin only received half of the Wound of the Centipede, half of the Rune of Death. This half concerns the death of the soul only, and said Death Root obviously contains the same half, hence why those afflicted by Death Root are dead only in soul, but still exist in a corporeal sense. 
they literally live within death. The reference to this as the mark of the centipede is obviously quite fitting for a couple of reasons. Firstly, and most obviously, this half of the rune does indeed resemble a centipede, but the more relevant connotation and to why it's probably shaped like a centipede in the first place from a design perspective is to more do with the ideas of rot and stagnation, a cultural understanding from Japanese Shinto, where flowing water is seen as good, pure and representative of life, where stagnation is seen as corruption, death and decay. In short, the idea of purity and the ever-flowing cycle of life in Shinto is commonly represented by flowing water of that flowing circle of life. So conversely, stagnant water is used to represent the perversion or halting of said cycle. Pests and insects thrive in stagnant water, and thus they are often used to depict corruption and rot. And again this is something prominently seen in the first Silent Hill, in the form of moths, cockroaches and grubs. Again as aptly described by Acer, stagnant water is another thematic indicator of Kegare. And to quote Acer directly once more, they say the following. Flowing water is life, and so it is good. Conversely, still waters are death. Now in Western culture we are of course familiar with flies, insects and maggots being a symbol of death and rot and decay. And indeed this is represented by the flies swarming around Godwin's decaying corpse. However, it is important to remember that a Japanese team made this, and so it's great to understand the cultural context behind these thematic designs. And so, with the understanding that flies, insects and other types of pests are representative of Kigari and stagnant waters, we again move to the centipedes. Centipedes fall within this category as a life form that thrives in decay and stagnant waters. And thus, in Japanese culture, centipedes are often used to symbolically represent stagnation or rot or pollution. Of course, the best representation of this is in From Software's media in Sekiro, where the presence of centipede parasites are meant to denote the stagnation and pollution of the divine waters, best illustrated by the monks of Senpo Temple who are literally overtaken by parasitic centipedes. The association with centipedes is made even more interesting then when we consider the golden centipede, which reads as follows. The golden desiccated remains of a centipede, material used for crafting items, kept as a fetish by the golden order fundamentalists, especially the hunters of those who live in death, as such they're found near churches or similar. Now a fetish is usually a talisman or some other object used for spiritual protection, and given it is a golden centipede, the mark of those who live in death, it makes sense that the Golden Order fundamentalists would use this when hunting those who live in death, given it's a golden inversion of their enemy's symbol. This is why the half wound of the centipede is representative of those who live in death, because they are literally stagnant forms of life. They are stuck living in death, stuck at one part of the cycle of life. They are existing outside the boundaries of the established laws. They are an extension of the pollution spilling from Godwin's corpse. They are Kegari, and so the associated imagery of centipedes and insects make sense. The idea of Kegari and crossing sacred bounds is why so often those who live in death are described to be out with the Golden Order, such as in the description of the Holy Water Pots, which reads as follows. Highly effective against those who live in death even preventing them from rising again. The Golden Order has no mercy for those who trespass beyond life's bounds. It's again the idea of trespassing beyond the boundaries, leading to pollution and stagnation, and the idea of their existence outside the bounds of order leading to a pollution of the order is reflected in the language of the hunters such as D, who states the following. Following only the guidance of the Great Elden Ring, those who live in death fall outside the principles of the Golden Order. Their mere existence sullies the guidance of gold, tainting its truth. And so it is, the vermin must be exterminated, down to the very last. And the ideas of stagnation, 
makes sense why the areas we find those who live in death are in stagnant waters. And it also maybe helps explain the aquatic tibia marinas, who seem to be an infection vector for the death route. It is just another thematic manifestation of the themes of stagnation and Kegari. Now, while the half wound of the centipede being death only in soul helps explain the undeath of those who live in death, I feel it is only part of the equation when it comes to explaining their existence. As we have just discussed, those who live in death are essentially a glitch in the system, and for this to occur, for a glitch to occur, there has to be a fault in the Golden Order. You may find this peculiar, but I discovered something in my examination of the Knight of the Black Knives. These souls have committed no offence. They have every right to life, only they happen to touch upon a flaw in the Order. Like Roger, I actually have a lot of sympathy for those who live in death, and the Dustborn ending was the first one I chose, despite also having Rani's ending ready to go. Roger correctly states that those who live in death have happened upon a flaw within the Golden Order. It is not perfect, as the fundamentalists would have you believe, and this flaw will be one that those familiar with my channel will of course heard me mention many times, as in my Gold Mask and Marika videos that flaw being the removal of death and confinement of it, and this is fittingly described by the Mending Rune of the Death Prince, which reads as follows. Formed of the two Hallobrand half-wheels combined, it will embed the principle of life within death into order. The Golden Order was created by confining destined death. So the very foundations of the Golden Order are built upon an order absent death, and we see this effect on the denizens of the world, a world where nobody dies. It really is a pitiful state of affairs. Unending life sounds great in theory, but in usual FromSoft fashion, we are quickly disabused of that notion. And when you peel away the surface layer and grandeur of the Golden Order, you can see it is fundamentally broken. For while it is true that those who live in death are stagnant, so are those within the Order. No one ever dies within the Order. How is that any less stagnant than those who live in death? The removal of death and then the murder of Godwin are the two main events that broke the world, as much as the shattering of the Elden Ring did. And indeed, Rogier seems to agree with that statement, that these were the pivotal events that led to the world becoming crooked. I once wished to become a scholar, you see. I've spent many an hour scouring the archives for knowledge of that fateful plot. The world has grown crooked. And if you intend to put it to rights, you'd better understand what happened to make it this way. Hmm? And yet, there are those looking for a workaround, a way to undo and reverse the corruption, rather than simply purging those who are afflicted. And so it's time to look at those who would undo the corruption and restore Godwin to his former glory. We have already covered the fact that Fortisax and Godwin developed a close bond due to their mutual respect in the War of the Dragons, and Godwin's sparing of the former's life. But the depths of this bond isn't really illustrated until we get to the latter parts of the game and we find Fortisax for ourselves, who to me is one of the most heroic characters in the entire story. Fortisax's remembrance reads as follows. After Godwin the Golden became the Prince of Death, the ancient dragon fought long and hard against the death within its companion. Alas, victory was never achieved, and its only reward was corruption. And this is indeed how we find Fortisax, renamed the Lich Dragon, due to the fact the ancient dragon himself has been suffused with death. Even the ancient dragons are not free from its pollution. This is apparent from his appearance. All other ancient dragons have a sort of golden beige hue to them, including his own sister. However, Fortisax is now stained with black, and you can see how well the design team have done here. He isn't just a black dragon, he still actually has his gold scales underneath if you look carefully, but it is more like he is stained with a black suit over the top, the mark of death. Much like when Rogier becomes suffused with death, Fortisax also seems to be sprouting the blight, the blight even bursting from his eye socket and through his skin. And it is no wonder Fortisax is now called the Lich Dragon. He is a dragon living within death. 
What is interesting is that it again shows the real corrupting power of the death, this pollution caused by the crossing of boundaries. The extent to which Fortis Axe is afflicted is pretty eye-opening, and it is elaborated on by the Death Lightning Incantation, which reads as follows. Incantation that channels the power of the ancient dragon Fortis Axe, now corrupted by death. It is said that this golden lightning was wielded by Godwin, and so this lightning was actually once Godwin's power that Fortis Axe now channels, and the corruption of death is so powerful that even this lightning is afflicted by it, showing it is a true metaphysical curse. And this is all well and good, but when you fight Fortis Axe, you may have some burning questions. Why is he so corrupted, and where the hell do we fight him? Well, Fortis Axe's remembrance implies that Fortis Axe is within Godwin's mind, within his soul, battling within the death in his old companion's body. Now this is a confusing concept to wrap your head around, but it does appear to be that there is a realm within Godwin that represents being within his corrupted body. We can enter this realm ourselves at the end of Fia's quest, when we are invited to enter the deathbed dream. Now given Fia is a deathbed companion, this must be Fia's dream bridging her mind to Godwin's, and so we use her as a medium to connect with Godwin's mind, and that is how we end up fighting Fortis Axe, or something along those lines. We'll discuss it more in the later chapters regarding Fia, where I will also talk about why we have to fight Fortis Axe. If this does represent a realm or pocket dimension within Godwin, it does let us know the true extent of death's saturation. The sky itself seems to be covered in a death blight, and it is in here, in this hellish realm of death, that Fortis Axe has spent a long time fighting against the death, trying to push it back, trying to cleanse his good friend from the inside out. Yet, as should be obvious from the spread of death in the world at large, and the suffused nature of Godwin's mind represented by the skybox, this was a doomed endeavour, and Fortis Axe has paid the price for his bravery. Yet it is one of the most heartwarming stories in the game, and I see Fortis Axe as a true hero. It wasn't just Fortis Axe who felt great sorrow at Godwin's fate. We of course now return to the Golden Epitaph as promised at the beginning of this video, which is most likely tied to Mikola. More specifically, we can make this tie-in via the specific ghost dialogue from Castle Saul. So that does bring us to the location of this ghost, Castle Sol, a bastion that appears to hold a cult dedicated to the resurrection of the Solus. So let's discuss this. Castle Sol, as seen by its banners, is a castle containing a group that seem to venerate the Eclipse in some capacity, and this is further supported by the great treasure of this castle, the Eclipse Shotel. The Eclipse is of course used elsewhere in Elden Ring and is closely associated with the mausoleums and their knights, and the Solus demigods housed within. The Eclipse Crest Great Shield, wielded by the mausoleum knights, reads the following. The Eclipse Sun, drained of colour, is the protective star of the Solus demigods. It aids the mausoleum knights by keeping death and death at bay. So the Eclipse is obviously a symbol associated with the Solus, and it is seen as a ward that will keep death and death at bay, obviously something to avoid for these soulless demigods so they don't die permanently before they are restored. A really great video on the subject of the Eclipse is one by Vlamit, and I highly recommend you check that out, and I will link below. The protective nature of the Eclipse as a type of ward therefore explains why it appears on the shields of the defenders of these soulless demigods. The Eclipse also thematically neatly fits in. Not only is the Eclipse extremely similar to the two sides of the Hallowbrand, but again, there are some cultural connotations to the Eclipse which are relevant to death, and we will shortly deal with those. But I want to first ask, what is the point of Castle Sol? What are they actually trying to achieve here? Well, let us try and uncover the purpose behind these people, the people who existed in Castle Sol. 
those who seem to venerate the Eclipse. We have already looked at one ghost dialogue, which implies the Eclipse could restore the soulless demigods, and so now let us turn to the other ghost dialogue found within the castle, one in the main chapel, who echoes the veneration of the Eclipse. O great sun, frigid sun of Sol, surrender yourself to the Eclipse, grant life to the soulless bones. So the connecting factor here seems to be the belief that the Eclipse swallowing the sun can restore the soulless demigods to full life. Yet what is the basis for this theory? Fortunately for me, I am friends with a creator far more familiar with Japanese cultural implications as well as the language itself. Of course, people familiar with the channel will know I'm referring to Last Protagonist, who has once again provided some excellent information in regards to the Eclipse. In a comment on V-Limit's video regarding the Eclipse, Last Protagonist said the following, and he's given me permission to share this comment. The term for Eclipse comes from Shoku, which is the same kanji for Mushibamu, which means worm-eaten, corroded, deteriorated, etc. This comes up a lot in Dark Souls to describe the way curses and the dark eat away through things, like in Gnaw, Dark Fog, Walnir's Holy Sword, etc. In Elden Ring, the term also comes up in items associated with Godwin, the Weathered Dagger, the Corruption of Fortisax, etc. This all ties in to the Eclipse Shoto, which is described as a sun being drained of colour. It might imply that there is or was a connection between the sun and the Grace of Gold, and might coincide with the Sun Realm Shield, or how Warming Stones say the Erd Tree was as warm and gentle as the sun." End quote. So again, brilliant insight from Last Protagonist, and if you're new to the channel, please check out their channel as they often help me out with Japanese translations and cultural connotations. And again, thanks to Last Protagonist. Now the part I want to focus in on is how Last Protagonist says this worm-eaten description ties into the Eclipse Shoto, which is described as a sun being drained of colour, being worm-eaten of colour, perhaps. I find this interesting because it's in line with the idea of the sun being eaten, like the ghost at Castle Sol mentions the Eclipse swallowing the sun. Is it then possible that the cultists of Sol are beckoning for the Eclipse to swallow the sun, to steal its vitality, to restore the soulless demigod? I do believe that this is their belief, that they wish the Eclipse to eat the vitality of the sun and take this vitality to restore the demigod, at least that's their belief, even if there isn't any weight to it. Specifically, it appears that the castle's Sol is a joint venture between the group at Sol and Mikola, given the ghost dialogue that we reviewed at the beginning of this chapter. And this is unsurprising given Mikola's great empathy for the outcast and forgotten, as well as his implied sympathy for his half-brother, as suggested by the Golden Epitaph. And I now want to make an editorial note here. I had far more planned in this chapter, for the soulless demigods, for necromancy, but as with, with my last video, the video is already becoming far too long, so I have decided to cut certain elements from the story. However, don't worry, I am already planning the next video that will pick up these pieces, and I'm going to do a combined video on death, including the death birds, necromancy, the soulless demigods, and perhaps Rosas. So, something to look forward to, more time talking about death. Woohoo! With that said, I want to turn to an important figure who champions Godwin's cause in an attempt to stand up for those without a voice. I am of course referring to Fia and the conclusion of Godwin's story. Fia is a fascinating character, whose story is presented to us right at the beginning of the game, during the introductory cinematic, where we quickly learn that Fia is a deathbed companion and also a tarnished. When trying to understand what a deathbed companion is, a good place to start is probably from Fia herself, who says the following. I was known as a deathbed companion. Where I come from, after I received the warmth and lively vigour from a number of champions, I lay with the remains of an exalted noble to grant him another chance at life. So Fia pretty much gives us the bare bones of what her position entails. They absorb the vitality of champions they embrace, such as us, and they use that stored vigour to breathe new life 
into those who have already passed. In this dialogue, Fia also seems to describe exactly what is depicted on her introductory slide art. She was lying with a noble to bear him into new life. I find the term bear him into new life interesting. It has connotations of childbirth and as you'll see later in this video and in her quest, she does seem to birth new life from the absorbed vitality of other champions. It isn't just a transference of energy, it is almost a recycling or reincarnation of the original vitality taken from the embraced champion. There is actually a lot of surrounding lore that can help explain the deathbed companions. For example, we get an allegorical description of their origins as a profession via the perfumer Tricia Ashes, which read the following. Tricia was once known as a healer who dedicated her efforts to treating misbegotten omen and all those seen as impure. When her efforts failed, she was a companion as they died, watching over them to ensure that they could pass on peacefully, free of pain. A tale akin to the origins of the deathbed companions. So by using Tricia's story as a comparison, the description seems to suggest that the deathbed companions were once that, an order of people who would be deathbed companions, companions to people on their deathbeds, to watch over and help them pass peacefully. However, in time it clearly evolved to where it was more about restoring people from their deathbeds. And I do find it interesting to consider the origins of the deathbed companions, mainly because the only one we meet is out of their context. But we can gleam a little of that context. Firstly, let us look at the Baldachin Blessing. It seems to show a temple covered in curtains or canopy-like fixtures, and the description of this item described these as being temples in the guise of a bedchamber, and obviously with beds, deathbeds being an important part of this order, this makes sense. This also matches up with the term baldachin, for a baldachin, according to Merriam-Webster, is a cloth-covered canopy fixed or carried over an important person or sacred object. So this matches the canopies we see on the temple shown in the Baldachin Blessing and the very cloak that Fia wears over her deathbed dress for travelling. These black robes look very much like curtains or canopies. Most likely then, the term Baldachin Blessing most likely means a blessing from these Baldachin covered temples. I could be wrong and Baldachin could be the name from where Fia is from or the name of a god associated with these temples. But either way, it does tie in to what we see as the kind of aesthetic overlay of this culture. However, the darkest part of this role is the fact that deathbed companions never choose who they lie with. This is directly told to us by Fia herself, who says the following when she chooses to lie with Godwin. This is goodbye, my dear, but I am satisfied. I choose to lie with Godwin of my own will, not the remains of one chosen for me. Therefore, Fia and her kind are directed to lie with the remains chosen for them, and given Fia tells us that it was a noble she was last told to lie with, I would assume the implication is that the upper classes benefit from this particular brand of resurrection. And the radiant Baldachin blessing also suggests that the deathbed companions don't even get to choose who they embrace to get the vigour to resurrect the nobles, as it reads as follows. It is said a deathbed companion will only produce a blessing of this kind for a champion but once in her entire life, the sole blessing which she imbues of her own volition, meaning that any other Goldachin blessing that is bestowed by a deathbed companion is not of their own volition, it is just a part of their duty. This lack of choice is quite key in Fia's motivations. So when Fia becomes tarnished and is exiled from this land that she hails, she chooses a new path and chooses to use her skills and powers for another purpose, her own purpose. She says the following. I see. Then you must kill me, for I am the companion of Godwin, Prince of Death. I wish to be a mother to those who live in death, so it is that any loathing, any hatred that overshadows them, I must bear as a matter of duty, 
with my own flesh. Fia chooses to defend those who, through no fault of their own, are hunted, persecuted and have no voice, have no choice. Given Fia's life of being told what to do as a deathbed companion and being chased from her homeland and now being bound by grace through no choice of her own, we can easily see why she would have great sympathy and empathy for these people. I feel her ideals must be similar to her allies, Rogier's, who quite rightly states that their existence, those who live in death, is no fault of their own. Sophia takes it upon herself to try and right this wrong and finally make some choices for herself. And the first way she does this is via her embraces. Not only is she using this energy in a build up for gestating her new child, but she also uses it in a more creative, defensive way. Fia appears to take a portion of the vitality of champions that she embraces and can summon them as champions to defend the Prince of Death, akin to the practice of carrying puppetry. This makes sense since we do see Rogier and Lionel in the fight against Fia's champions. Both tarnished, we know she has embraced, as she mentions Rogier in that context and we later find her belongings alongside Lionel's in a bed in Lane Dell. To be clear, these are akin to puppets. These blue manifestations are the same colour as the carrion puppets. They are not the actual champion themselves being summoned like a blue phantom, rather an imprint of them, especially since Rogier will be dead by this stage that we face him as a Fia champion. This is actually a rather impressive feat and it really emphasises how much power Fia gains from absorbing the power of champions, and it will play a key role in her gestation of the Mending Rune. And yet, to make this Mending Rune, she needed the two sides of what brought the curse of Unlife to the Lands Between, the two sides of the Hallowbrand. And so she sets ourselves and Rogier in motion to retrieve it, though she makes great efforts to hide her true motivations and interests only portraying herself as someone who is interested in helping Rogier, a friend, while mysteriously handing us a pivotal map that she got from a friend of a friend of a friend. Meanwhile, Rogier also seems to let a secret slip to her. Fia has already mentioned how Rogier says things while abed, and he appears to hold another secret that would be of much interest to Fia. It is the same secret he divulges to us in the form of a note after his death. Written in a trembling hand, it says the following. I forgot to tell you, but it seems Dee has a younger brother. I heard he lies in a deep sleep in the aqueduct besides the eternal city of Nokron, and it is said he stood before the Prince of Death, not far beyond that spot. Now with this note, everything that transpires between Fia and Dee makes complete sense. Fia knew that Dee's brother had stood before the Prince of Death, and this no doubt explains why we find the twin huddled and broken, not far from where Godwin lies. And now, with that in mind, let us look at the weathered dagger that Fia asks us to return to Dee. It reads as follows. Dagger received from Fia, the deathbed companion. She wishes for it to be returned to its rightful owner. It was once a special weapon of gold and silver entwined, but is now worn down and marred by a black gash. A knife marred by a black gash and worn down, evidently a weapon of D or his brother, and surely given those two bits of lore, we can assume that this blade was turned against Godwin given the black gash on the blade. But to what end? Well the answer, I believe, comes from Fia herself when we reach her in the deep root depths. She says the following. Have you ever seen a Hallowbrand? When the first of the demigods died, his flesh was marked with the half-wheel wound of the centipede. Godwin's Hallowbrand has since been recovered at the Round Table Hold. But there is another Hallowbrand out there somewhere, and I must find it. Godwin's Hallowbrand has since been recovered at Round Table Hold, meaning it wasn't on Godwin's person meaning someone had it at round table hold, and thus to me anyway, it is explained why Fia actually kills D. It isn't because he is a Golden Order hunter, no, he has Godwin's Hallowbrand, and she takes it from his cold, dead hands. 
This is my speculation again, but what I see to be the chain of events given the lore we've examined just now. Dee's brother stood before Godwin and carved out his Hallowbrand from Godwin's very flesh, the act that mars his blade and drives him to slumber. And given his state, the brand will come to be possessed by Dee, his twin brother, for safekeeping. Fia learns of this via Rogier, the secret he will tell to us later, and knowing she will come into conflict with a tarnished, she develops Fia's mist, an incantation only effective against the undying tarnished. For all his martial strength, Dee is no match for the death plate, and Fia lures him into a trap by passing the knife to Dee that all but says I know and revealing her true loyalties. Fia then kills him with the death plate, reclaims the Hallowbrand and disappears into the night to be by Godwin's side. It's actually a brilliant bit of storytelling, a master plan that happens in front of our very eyes but is so subtle because neither Fia nor Dee show their hands to us. And if we choose to return the other half of the Hallowbrand to Fia, which of course was the intended result of stoking Rogier's interest in finding the other half of the Hallowbrand, then the end game of her plan can come into effect. She can bind these two together through a gestation ritual. She says the following of this. I will soon lay with Godwin, and it will surely stir within me the new life of the Golden Prince and first dead of the demigods as the ruin of those who live in death. Please, do one thing for me. Brandish this child, my rune, and take for yourself the throne. Stay the persecution of those who live in death. And so it seems as though Fia's position as a deathbed companion is absolutely key in the formation of this rune. Long as she channeled the power of champions, vitality, to resurrect the dead, as I noted earlier, this process through semantics is indicated to be akin to childbirth. And now again, she refers to this as her child, this rune, not a child in the traditional sense, but a recycling of life that is akin to the unnatural process of giving birth in the real world. And not only is this a child of Godwin and Fia, but Fia also implies it is partially our child, for she is using the warmth of our vigour from our last embrace to breathe life to gestate this new child. Of course, unfortunately, this is where we must face and kill one of the truest heroes of Elden Ring, Fortisax. Fortisax has spent unknowable years within Godwin's mind, fighting and resisting the death within his friend, and yet that now means he is an obstacle to the birth of the Mending Rune. This Mending Room is death, and Fortisax's influence in pushing back death will no doubt mean he is halting the birth of the Death Rune. And so it is with great sorrow that we must put the blighted beast down, so Godwin and Fia's child may come forth. So what does this Mending Rune represent for the future for those who live in death? and for the world at large. Well, let us first of all read the description of the rune itself and try to understand. It reads the following. Formed of the two Hallowbrand half-wheels combined, it will embed the principle of life within death into order. The Golden Order was created by confining death in death. Thus, this new order will be one of death restored. So first of all, it makes it clear that it is both sides of the Hallowbrand. This is not the original Rune of Death, and given it's both sides of the Hallowbrand, you may assume that it restores original Death and Death, and makes Death normal again, given that both halves represent the two sides of Death. However, I think it's clear this isn't the case, as the Rune specifically mentions that life within Death, those who live in Death, are brought into the Order. It will not be removed, or reversed, or made full Death. They are being brought in to the Order. This is also backed up by the fact that Fia states, With this, Godwin can take his rightful place as first of the dead and claim a second, illustrious life. This implies that Godwin will continue to be the source of those who live in death, but will take a new kind of position of power within the new order as first of the dead. This literally seems to just be bringing everything that's outside the order in regards to those who live in death, including Godwin, 
into it without actually changing them, in my opinion. Now the mending room does suggest that death will be restored, maybe implying that normal death will be restored. But bear in mind this isn't the original rune of death, and so if we consider the science, if you want to call it, of runes, this isn't the rune of death. This is the rune of the death prince, meaning that the prince of death as he is, is still going to exist in this order. It is his order that is being incorporated into the golden order. This is the age of the duskborn, and given dust's inherent connection to death, we could literally translate this to the age of the deathborn. And while this sounds utterly repellent, consider this might just be the right thing to do. Those who live in death did not choose to be what they are, and it was the current order that led to them existing at all through their poor choices. Perhaps a new era of life within death, death overseen by Godwin, will have a new just era of life. So thanks guys, that is my take on Godwin, the Prince of Death. A fascinating subject and a pretty deep one. Had a lot of fun doing this video. Uh, as I said, there's going to be some other parts of this video that I took out that I think will fit coherently in their own video. So keep an eye out for that. And as many people have requested, I am also doing a video on the stuff that I took out from the Marika video, including the one great stuff. I think that's a really interesting chapter and I think you'll really enjoy it. If you like this video, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel as I do plenty of Elden Ring lore. If you want to support the channel other ways, I do do Patreon and I do memberships. Apart from that, guys, just let me know in the comments below what you think about the Prince of Death, if there's anything important you think I looked over. But until next time, guys, I will see you in the deep root depths. Take care and have a lovely night.